All right, welcome to OK Computer. I'm Dan Nathan, joined by Deirdre Bosa. She is the host of CNB's Tech Check, and she is hot off the TV to join us on the Fine Pod. D, welcome. It's a busy TV day. I rush to the camera to one, from one camera to another. I know. Now, now you're on the mic and the camera. Um, we're going to get to what you were just reporting on. We're going to talk about uh, it's just everything going on in AI, and it seems to be really concentrated around the biggest names in the NASDAQ right now and making some really big moves in some of the biggest names um, in the private markets. And this week, it's Amazon and Anthropics. So we're going to talk about that. Um, also, after D&I get done with all this, stick around for a conversation I had with Scott Cohen. He's the CEO of Ju. Box. That's JKBX. This is the first platform that will offer fans, retail investors, and music lovers like me the opportunity to invest in music royalties at scale. This is a fascinating uh, conversation for people interested in music, people interested in kind of Web3 sort of themes as it talks about, you know, kind of fans participating in, in, in the ownership of different things. Um, but also, if you're interested in markets and secondary markets and, and the like here, um, Scott and I went over a lot of really interesting things. D, I think this is going to be something that you are going to see on CNBC in the not so distant future, probably reporting on. So stick around for that conversation. All right. I was going to say, Dan, you piqued it. my interest. I want to hear more about Jukebox. Now. Yeah, no, really, really interesting stuff to be to, to be frank. So, um, so that's a great conversation. All right, you and I were just talking. Um, we're going to get to the Amazon thing in, in a second here, but the Nasdaq feels like it has a different vibe over the last week or so, and it really started with Fed Chair Powell um, last week saying that uh, you know rates are going to stay higher for longer. Jamie Dimon is out overnight, I think, to the Times of India, which is kind of odd that he would make this this point that we could see Fed funds as high as 7% and the world is not ready for it. Why not actually take the mic here in the US um, and offer that up? But what was interesting is that the knee jerk reaction of high valuation tech stocks, and most importantly, some of the biggest ones, which brings me back to late 2021, D, when the Fed basically declared they were wrong about inflation being transitory, and they were going to raise interest rates off that zero interest rate bound, right, to battle inflation. And all of the names that we're going to talk about over the next 15 minutes got just got creamed, right? And so here we are. I kind of feel like, again, talk to me. Are you feeling a different vibe? Because as we're recording, it's midday on Tuesday, Microsoft, Apple are both down 2%, Amazon, Google down both near 3%. You know, NVIDIA and Tesla are starting to join the party here a little bit. You know what they are. They're the MAG7. They make up 53, or excuse me, they make up 43% of the NASDAQ 100, um, and Apple's down 13% from its highs. Microsoft's down 15% from its highs. Amazon down 13%. Google, 8 NVIDIA, 15 Tesla, 17 Meta, 8%. So those are all from the recent 52-week or all-time highs. Talk to me about just the vibe. Let's do a little vibe check on the NASDAQ, on the MAG7 here. <laughs> vibe check, um, I'm with you. Feels the dude for big tech. However... Nothing has changed in the fundamentals. And I think we've seen this play out before when the Fed started to raise rates. It was just this risk off vibey environment, but it doesn't change things for the big tech companies. These are hugely profitable, free cash flow generating companies. It changes the whole thesis for unprofitable tech, without a doubt. Those are the companies that are in trouble. Their discounted cash flow models completely change when interest rates go up. But for the biggest of the big, Nothing has changed. I mean, I guess maybe there's worries about a recession and the demand picture for them, but these are still sort of um, the most pristine balance sheets, not just in tech, but sort of out there as a whole. So we saw this play out before. There was this risk off sort of sentiment. But then when folks and investors started to realize that these are still really great companies, they went back in and they were almost defense plays, right? That's not how you typically think of technology companies, but because they have free cash flow because they have, you know, these huge cash fortresses. They became defense plays, even in a market environment where rates were rising. And I don't know if that's going to change. Yeah, well, you know, you make a great point. And, and really that defensive sort of trade emerged um, in March when, you know, the regional banking crisis was like, you know, like you know, the headline here. And we saw money move out of financial names and move into them. And also a really interesting, you know, kind of thing to note here is that a lot of those big companies refinanced a lot of their debt at much lower rates. And now they have these huge cash piles to your point, and they're earning real return on those cash. So, so their income or excuse me, the, um, the cost of, you know, financing debt has actually gone down on a relative basis. And they're finally earning, um, a little bit on that. So I, I agree with all that. And, and just to look at the mag seven though, you know, there is 
the Google, which is expected to grow, you know, earnings and sales, let's call it double digits and trades at, at a market multiple. And, and you could throw Meta in there. And then you have, you know, an Apple and Microsoft that are trading at, you know, near 30 times with, you know, similar expected growth. And so they just look a little bit different. So at some point, you know, if things get a little sloppy, we have the NASDAQ down about eight and a half percent from those recent highs. You know, I suspect all those stocks join the party a bit. You have the Teslas and the NVIDIAs go down more because because they're up a lot more off of those recent lows. But, you know, again, I do agree with you at some point when you take out a little bit of the enthusiasm around the AI trade that was building all year long in most of these names, at some point it becomes a decent place to get back in because you and I have talked about this a lot over the last few months is like once we see the revenue start coming in and we can go back to late July when all those companies, Microsoft in particular, announced the pricing of their copilot, that was the top. Right. But if we start seeing it built into estimates in 2024, that's maybe after a correction where these stocks go back up. Well, this is the good point, actually. If you think of generative AI of businesses within big tech companies that are money losing becomes less appealing when rates are rising, right? You have to use that discounted cash flow model and it all of a sudden doesn't look as attractive. So if Jay Powell is saying that rates could go higher, um, and those profits are going to be pushed further out into the future. Investors aren't going to give as much value. And as a result, I think you're right, Dan, you've seen some of the hype come out of the AI bubble a little bit. I think it's always going to be there, but it may not be as highly valued. Just to that point, just going back to that DCF number, it's not going to be as highly valued in this kind of environment. And you saw that if I could transition to sort of one of the biggest stories of this week that I've been reporting on is Anthropic and Amazon, right? It kind of is doing a little bit of that Microsoft open AI playbook where it's deepening its partnership with one of the buzziest, hottest, you know, generative AI companies. And for listeners who may not know exactly what Anthropic is, um, it has, it's known as the open AI rival. It's chatbot is called cloud or Claude. What do you call it, Dan? Cloud? Yeah, is it French? I, I want to be French. Cloud. I want to be uh, like, I'm, I'm a Frank with file cloud. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's, and it's an interesting move for Amazon because it has said, okay, we're just going to spread out across the generative AI companies and tools, et cetera. We're not going to make a big bet on one, but that's essentially kind of what it's doing here. I would say, though, that this is very different than Microsoft and OpenAI, which had an exclusive partnership. Anthropic has also taken investment from Google and has a partnership with them. So this is spreading out a little bit. And you know, going back to the point, this is going to cost money. Talk about the huge amounts of compute power that's necessary. There's a reason Anthropic needs Amazon. It can't pay for all that compute power on its own. Yeah, you know, it's also interesting, though, that you, you mentioned the Google investment. And so this investment by AWS is $1.25 billion. It says it could grow to $4 billion. It starts to look like that open AI deal that Microsoft did. But the most important point, and I know you follow this space really closely, is that AWS becomes their primary cloud provider. So that seems like a huge win over Google. No, I mean, like, you know, like, but, but listen, today, it's interesting. Do you see how poorly Oracle is acting, you know, like, like there's other stocks in the space. Like if it's going to be an arms race that you're going to have to invest billions to kind of get these companies to get a investment, but also lock them up as being the primary cloud provider. That's my only point is that like, I think that investors were buying these mega cap tech stocks indiscriminately because they thought they were best positioned to harness these tools and deploy them across, you know, their services. And I think AWS is clearly one of those that can do that. I don't think Oracle has the cross-selling um, opportunities, not nearly as good as let's say Microsoft does or a Google does with their productivity cloud and search and, and, and the like here. So, you know, to me, I think that what's emerging is that there are going to be three major public market players, okay? That's obvious with Microsoft. Now, Amazon with Anthropic, and then you obviously have Google with what they've well, been- Well, don't count out Meta, yeah. by the way. Don't count yeah. out Meta. Well, well, talk to us a little bit a lot about Llama because this, this, this tool, this large language model is meant to be open source. And I know that a lot of folks in the tech community think that this might be a bit of a savior as it relates to some of these big entrenched platform companies. And I think that's really important. And that is not reflected right now in its valuation, even despite how far this stock has come off its lows late last year. And it's sort of been this year of efficiency play, right? It hasn't got the same kind of halo effect um, that the other ones have had for its push into generative AI when, you know, many folks in the technology industry, technologists, if you want to call that, that say that Llama is 
the most interesting model because like you said, it's open source. And there is sort of this belief that you're going to have all of these individual models that each company is going to create its own or each industry will create its own because um, they need to be protective of their data. And that's essentially what Llama enables you to do. But I also think that a key part of this is releasing the products, putting them out there for public consumption. That's how this whole thing got started with chat GBT, right? Google has had the ability with Bard to have this really interesting, engaging chat bot, but it was late to do so. That may not matter, fine. But there was also an announcement yesterday, or I don't know if you saw the video, Dan, um, that ChatGPT put out, that it's now taking verbal and image prompts. I mean, it, it kind of felt like a chat GPT moment again, the one, the likes of which we got, what, 10 months ago. Um, there's a video going around and someone posts a picture of a bike and says, how do I lower the seat? Just with the picture. And chat GPT is able to tell you exactly where the lever is, which tool to use, et cetera, et cetera. And sort of what occurred to me watching this is, wow, this really is displacing search. And I don't think it will displace Google search because Google has these tools, but it's not putting them out there at the same rate that an open AI is. And I think that we're going to get an event this week um, from Meta talking about how it's integrating chatbots just for people uh, just for people to use. Of course, you can argue whether or not that's a good or bad thing, that maybe they do need to move slower and go through all the checks and make sure that they don't get out of hand. But certainly, I think that you know, 10 months into this generative AI hype cycle, chat GPT, open AI are still still one of the most interesting plays, even though it costs a lot of money. And, and putting my fast money hat on for a second here. So Microsoft is down, like I said earlier, 15% from the day in which they announced those the, the pricing of their AI tools that co-pilot suite. And it's interesting, it's trading near three month lows here. So the, the fever has broken, if you will, at least from like the, the tape bombs. And you just said this video has been going around. It felt like a chat GPT for moment, but yet the stock is not reacting. And I would say that's a good thing. You know what I mean? If you buy into this as transformative technology and it's going to take some time to work its well, its way through these products and services and really find its way into the earnings models, right? Of, of a lot of investors and Wall Street analysts, then that makes sense. I just go back and forth and say, listen, you and I and, and most investors are not going to know whether it's Microsoft, the runaway winner, and they leave, you know, Bard and, and Alphabet in the dust or Meta and Llama or, you know, um, whatever Amazon is going to be working on. But I'll just say this right now, at least investors have voted with their wallets because, you know, again, Microsoft trades 28 times this year, expected earnings and sales growth, let's call it 12, 13% or so, you know, on a PE to growth and everything. Like that. That's expensive. If I look at a Meta, you know, even after the run that it's had, it's trading about, you know, 22 times it's growing earnings and sales much faster expected than Microsoft. And you got to remember, this is a company that saw massive deceleration right over the last few years and, and that pivot from. And then Google is the same thing. I mean, Google trades again at a market multiple and is expected to have high teens earnings growth and low teens sales growth. So to me, it might be for different reasons. You know what I mean? But I think Microsoft having some of that enthusiasm come out of it makes perfect sense. And I think there's going to be opportunities in some of the laggards because I don't think it's one, you know, it's a runaway train for Microsoft from here on out. Maybe not, but then you look at an NVIDIA, right? And this is sort of, if you think that we are in the earliest stages of this generative AI shift and we've seen the benefits so far only for the chip makers like an NVIDIA that is far and away, you know, the biggest benefactor from this, beneficiary for, from this shift, you think we still have yet to see the applications and monet especially the applications monetize. So if you think that it's going to be Microsoft, Google, Meta, Amazon, all of the above, they might look cheap. And, and again, it depends on the risk off risk on environment that we're in and interest rates take some of the wind out of that, but I think it I think it goes back to interest rates. I don't think that it has to do with excitement over generative AI. Yeah, I just one thing on, on NVIDIA, and, and I guess the story is, you know, this is a company that with, you know, like the, the, the tailwind of demand for their advanced GPUs for the training of these models, right? So in late May, we saw that, you know, 70%, you know, year over year growth, right? And then we saw it decelerate. It was still fabulous. If you think about it, you know, what, what they reported, um, you know, earlier in the summer, you know, that's going to be decelerating. And sometimes when investors see that sort of deceleration, that's when they start thinking about valuations and the like. And I think it's a really important 
important point about this anthropic deal is that Amazon has its own advanced GPUs. And part of it is that they are going to train, this is anthropic, those models based on Amazon's chips. And then there's another, you know, headline. This was out of the information today. And I, and I thought this was really um, interesting that Microsoft is working on a plan B. Yeah, they're all in on open AI, but the cost to compute. So when you talk about how they're building in this technology, let's say to Bing search where they have no market share and, and really expectations are very low. And, and to your point, I don't know how it's going to go, but very low that they're going to gain meaningful market share in search versus let's say Google. Um, you know, they're looking for cheaper ways, right? To, to kind of engage um, potential users because the cost to compute with open AI is really high. And if they can't commercialize it, if they can't bring in revenue, then that means it's going to come at a cost to them, right? So there's going to be different values. If you pay for the subscription for chat GPT, maybe you get that stuff. But if you don't and you want free search, then it's going to come, you know, using similar sorts of tools. So I don't know. I thoughts there because I, I thought that was a really important headline. We'll put that, that story in the show notes too. Well, because the way to reduce costs in this generative AI shift is to reduce costs on the compute power. NVIDIA dominates the marketplace. They can charge whatever they want for those GPUs. So that creates a lot of incentive for Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, every big tech company that needs those chips to go out and create their own at a much cheaper price, right? Because the margins are just huge that NVIDIA is getting because it can. It's a monopoly right now. Everyone wants those H100 GPUs. What Amazon has been doing is developing its own custom AI chips at a lower cost to them. And as part of that Anthropic deal earlier this week, they said that they Anthropic, one of you know the buzziest companies in AI is going to use those chips. I would just caution here. We don't know how reliant Anthropic is on those chips. It is very likely that they're also using NVIDIA H100s, which in which Amazon supplies. I would love to know the breakdown of that because that's really important to know whether Amazon, this is a sustainable business and it's going to be a big business for them and really reduce their costs and reduce that reliance on NVIDIA. Yeah, they didn't make it easy for us. This is Amazon. Those are Tranium and Inferentia. Inferentia chips. Those are the name of the chips there. Um, yeah, no, listen, I, I, again, I, we can kind of maybe put a bow on this. It's like, okay, so so here's a company that was, you know, Amazon has been using machine learning for a whole host of things as it relates to, you know, um, their retail business, but also, you know, a, a, across a, a, AWS, the, you know, so like, to me, this is not like new to these companies. I, I think that a lot of folks, a lot of investors, it was easy to kind of place them in a bucket of, okay, you know, they missed the boat here. And, you know, the fact that Microsoft snuck up on everybody, with the open AI thing. So who knows, you know, and again, 1.25 billion, maybe it goes to 4 billion. It's kind of um, a rounding error. These, this company had what, 6 billion in, in, in cash flow last quarter alone or something like that. At least, at least it gets them in the game. All right, let's talk quickly. Um, you just got off the air on CNBC. You were on the halftime uh, with my main man, Scott Wapner, and you were talking about this FTC suit against Amazon, 17 states joined in. It seemed like one of those things is like, God, how many of these have we seen over the last 20 years with these major you know, tech companies? What, what, what is your sense for this? I mean, there was kind of, you know, we knew this was kind of coming here. Um, it's easy to kind of poo-poo these things in the moment because they take a long time to work themselves out. And sometimes they're just settlements for cash with a couple of adjustments to the business. Thoughts here, because I know this is one you've had your eye on for a while. Yeah. And whenever these regulatory stories come up, which they often do, and I've got to put it in context, it's one of the most challenging things that I cover as a tech reporter because they don't move the stock. Investors, they yawn at it. They're very complacent. But over the long term, what it has the ability to do is sort of eat away at the businesses. So this morning, you know, I, I had heard that the decision was going to come out today. So I started to dig around a little bit and say, what, what has Amazon actually done differently or not done differently since Lena Khan took over at the FTC? Remember when she took over, this was the big tech bulldog. It was her mission to hold them accountable. She did this paper at Yale looking at Amazon's place in the market and saying that you know antitrust laws needed to be updated. Well, I went back and I looked at the data. <laughs> and you know what Amazon has done since she's had her position trying to hold them accountable, ramped up acquisitions. Amazon has done three of its five largest acquisitions during her tenure. One Medical, iRobot, and MGM. And 
iRobot still needs to go through. I think the FTC is is kind of figuring out whether they want to challenge it or not, but the other two have gone through. And they've also made, to our point, investments in the buzziest generative AI companies like Anthropic, another one is Hugging Face. So it hasn't, she hasn't accomplished much. And she's also had some setbacks, especially when you look at Microsoft Activision. So this case is really make or break for her and for Amazon. She could literally break up Amazon, but I don't know that investors see that as a bad thing. They <laughs> see that it could actually be more valuable if she does that. Um, but you know, actually, Dan, some of the folks that I talk to in the tech world, they say that she has shot her credibility so badly that she's not going to be here 12 months from now. And so big tech might actually look to do more deals and close them in 18 months, not 12 months, because they don't expect her to be there because she... Um, has been so toothless and the FTC under her has been so toothless. Yeah. The irony there is that this is a pretty bipartisan issue. If you think about the Trump administration, he was yelling about Bezos for four years. You know what I mean? So I could see even another administration maybe picking this case up. But your point is a really good one. And this is really focused on their retail monopoly, right? And you listed the, the names or those different uh, acquisitions that they've made. And, and again, they don't, they, you know, Whole Foods came, what, five years ago or something like that. So they haven't done a whole heck of a lot um, as it relates to, to retail. Um, you know, one name that we haven't really even mentioned yet, and, and it's not gotten a lot of attention as it relates to AI. We know this is a company that spent, you know, billions and billions on R&D and machine learning over the last, you know, 10, 15 years or so. But this would be Apple. And it was an interesting story. I think it was today. It was, it was in quartz. Apple may be uh, quiet on AI, but it's also the biggest buyer of AI companies. Since 2007, Apple has been the top buyer of AI and machine learning companies. They've bought 21 since 2017, which I think is kind of interesting. And, you know, I go back to that week on July 18th or so, again, when Microsoft announced the pricing, I think Salesforce announced their pricing of some of their uh, generative AI tools. Uh, so did Adobe. There was an article in Bloomberg that week about how Apple is scurrying to figure out large language models and other, uh, you know, generative AI. And listen, all of this plays into what they want to do with spatial computing, right? If you think about it too. So thoughts on Apple, like out there, at least on the West Coast in the Valley, um, have they just kind of been ignored in this whole thing? We spent a lot of time talking about Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, and Meta, not a whole heck of a lot with Apple. We know that Apple is obviously always very, very quiet about what they are doing and the timelines for that. But is this a sleeper here? Is this one that, you know, ultimately, again, this is not a cheap stock. So it's not like, you know, it's not in the valuation. And we know that we've been talking talking to Siri for 10 years and she doesn't produce a whole heck of a lot of usefulness <laughs> for us. So, so maybe, maybe it's all in, uh, you know, maybe it's all for not. You know, it was funny last night. Um, my kid asked me a question I couldn't answer. So I asked Alexa and she bugged out. And so I had to ask Siri. It was the first time I'd done so in a while. Um, I think that Apple is the sleeper generative AI play. You just sort of, the numbers are behind it. They've been making acquisitions and maybe not quite as loudly and not at the same scale as Microsoft and Amazon, but you can't deny that Apple quietly works on things. They don't need as much attention because they have the iPhone and they have all these great products that everyone loves. Um, but if Apple's really working on an autonomous car, that itself is, is such a huge undertaking in the world of artificial intelligence that it has to have that heft behind it. And, and I go back to, um, when was it that developer conference when Apple released the VR AR headset and they didn't even say the words artificial intelligence or AI. They, they tried to talk about machine learning and ML. And I thought that just sort of made me laugh because it feels like Apple doesn't need the credit. They're quietly working on things and quietly confident. Um, by the way, the last thing I wanted to say to you, Dan, I took two autonomous vehicle rides in San Francisco over the last few weeks. I took a cruise and a Waymo. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to spill the beans too early for my piece, but Waymo is so far ahead of cruise. It's not even funny. It was like, honestly, dangerous to be in a cruise car and Waymo was just so smooth. That's really interesting. So I met um, somebody from Waymo without naming any names either a few weeks ago. Um, and this person said, you got to get in one of these things because whatever you guys think you're saying about them, you know what I mean, on CNBC or this and that or whatever, until you go in one, until you have that experience, um, you know, you may think differently about it. So I, I'm looking forward next time I'm out um, in L.A. or San Francisco. I told this person that I will get in that Waymo. I said, you know what, we might even do a podcast in one because the person said to me, 
all the things that you can do when you don't have to be focused on the road. So, so D, maybe we have a date next time I'm in, I'm in SF. We'll get in a Waymo. We'll do a podcast after your reporting. Listen, I really appreciate you taking time from your busy day. I'm sure I'll see you on Fast Money later talking about um, this Amazon FTC piece. Um, so thanks a lot for joining us. Of course. As always, thanks for having me. All right. Stick around for my conversation with Scott Cohen of Jukebox. All right, welcome back to OK Computer. I am here with Scott Cohen. He is the CEO at Jukebox. That is JKBX. Scott, welcome to the pod. Nice to be here. All right, you are an intro from a friend of mine named Sam Hendel, who is the founder of Jukebox, um, and he is also the chairman there. And, and Sam and I have had the, the benefit of getting to know each other over the course of the last year or so. Um, he is a huge music fan, but he's also as an entrepreneur and a brilliant one at that. And also, um, I would say just a, a killer dude in finance. Also, he has kind of married many of his professional loves and his personal loves into Jukebox, which is the company that you are the CEO of. And he's mentioned on many occasions when Scott is in town next, you got to sit down and talk to him because his background is not traditional uh, music executive sort of background. Um, but the things that you guys are doing over there is so unique um, and it really has the potential to transform the music business in and of itself. So again, thanks for being here. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about your background. We'll talk about how you and Sam came to be a little bit because you have a really interesting um, career um, that has obviously been inspired in different aspects by the music business, but you have not been in the music business your whole career. Uh, well, I actually have been in my in the music business yeah. my whole career, but not a musician, but right? Not and, a musician, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, unless you count playing the trumpet in the <laughs> third grade. Were you any good at it? I, I was so bad at it, but I was going to have this at, in the this kind of I don't know what you call it, you know, where the you you get in front of uh, an assembly and yeah. you play, you know. And I was in the band again, third grade. Uh, and so, so don't think, you know, uber talented third grader, like normal third yeah. grader. Um, and, and, and I was practicing cause I had a big solo the day before I'm practicing and my sister walks in the room and she smashes the front of the trumpet right into my lip and says, shut the fuck up as I was practicing. <laughs> and she split my lip, oh my which goodness. as a trumpet player, yeah, it's and, and I'm using that, that, that trumpet player as if I was a trumpet player, you know, but, uh, I, uh, she that ended it. your music career ended right there. Ended my and then? career. Ended my career. I hope you've reminded her on many occasions. You know what I mean. That you had to become a music executive to stay close to the music industry. Yes, this is the only way I'm back in because I didn't have the talent or the lip. All right. So talk to me. Like, how did you get into the business as an executive, and, and how did you spend most of your time over the last couple of decades? Well, yeah, it, it, go, it goes back to the the '90s. Probably it was 1995. I had an office here in the city. And I get a call one day from this guy. His name was Richard Goderer, who's now become one of my dear friends and longtime business partners. Mm -hmm. and, and he calls up and he's like, he heard that I was managing some act and a friend of his from EMI Records said he should work with him. We should produce an album, sell it, you know, sign him to EMI, blah, blah, blah. And he tells me, look, I, I, I'm a, I was a famous songwriter in the 60s. I wrote songs like, uh, my boyfriend's back. Do you know that song? Yeah, my boyfriend's. My boyfriend's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a doo wop sort right, of thing, right? right? That yeah. was recorded by the Angels. Yeah. And in, in 1963. Wow. And then he wrote a song called "I Want Candy." Yeah. I yeah. want candy. Yeah. Dun, it was dun, like a punk. That was like dun, a, that was like a bit of a later. Yeah. It was first done by the Strange Loves. Uh, then by uh, it's been recorded by tons of people. Bow wow wow. Bow wow wow. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. And and then and so so, so he was a songwriter. He was a producer. He produced Blondie and the Go Go's, all this stuff. So he wants to produce this act. And by the way, and, and so I don't know. I'm just taking him at his word. Um, there was no way to Google him because it hadn't been Didn't invented exist. yet. The band failed. We never got got him signed or anything. But Richard said, "Let's start a record company together." And I'm super excited. Start a record company with Richard Goderer. Because not only was he a songwriter and a producer, he was the co-founder of Sire Records. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know Sire Records, think the Ramones, the mm -hmm. Pretenders, mm -hmm. the Talking Heads, Madonna, like superstar They owned artists. the late 70s, early 80s, <sighs> into, into probably the early 90s. Yeah, yeah, an amazing label. So we start this record label together. Um, and we get an office down in the Lower East Side. And 
it becomes apparent very quickly that we are the two worst record executives <laughs> ever. Because I don't know what Richard was thinking, because I know what I was thinking, that I'm gonna work with this guy, he's way more experienced, I was only 30 years old at the time, he's 25 years older than me, he's done all this amazing shit, and then it turns out that although he co-founded Sire Records, he never ran the company. He had no idea how to run a company. So he thought I knew what I was doing and I didn't know anything. So he had access to the acts, basically. Yeah, and he was a he good was, talker. Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, 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 he was yeah, more like a producer. Yeah, yeah. Like, all right, he's yeah. a, and he is a fun guy to go out with, great stories. So the record label failed miserably. I lost all my money, but what it did was I had to rely on the new technology of the day. Mm -hmm. I had an idea. And that was to leverage the World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. This is 1995, mm -hmm. dial-up modems, 28.8, mm -hmm. not even 56K modems, like super slow. And what I did was, uh, to, to get the record label going, because we couldn't get any marketing or promotion or sales, mm -hmm. um, I got a bunch of interns from NYU and came down to work for free. By the way, I'm, I'm totally against free interns now. I've changed. I, 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 it's a longer story. I, I'm with you. I think you pay your interns. We've had plenty, and we pay all our interns too. Because obviously, I, I, like, like just to, as an aside, I just think that they need to like learn about incentives too. And if you're like, going to be a mentor to somebody, you need right. to teach them how to like act and, and, and how to be responsible and, and who right. is a responsible mentor also. So and I you should you. pay them because yeah. then what happens is only people of privilege can Correct. can live in New York City and do a free internship yep. because of who their parents are are and paying their rent. But I didn't know any of that. I didn't even know how to run a business, let alone to pay an intern. But we got them anyway, and they were free. And we had a whole bunch of computers. We actually had 10 computers, six phone lines, wow. and we and dial-up modems. And you, we, I'd have the interns go into AOL message boards, because remember, the web was very different then. There was no music being played, no photos, no video. It was all text-based. But you could see people talking about music. And so when they would talk about music in a particular genre, because they'd be talking about a band, yep. there'd be band pages, that was something similar to the w artists on our label, I'd have the intern click on the username and you could send them an email. And they'd send them an email like, hey, I see you're talking about Nine Inch Nails. Well, we have this goth industrial band <laughs> on our label called Godhead, check you should out. check them out. Oh, wow. 1995, we got a 100% response rate. Wow. 100% It makes response. sense. I mean, and then, and then they would run down to Tower Records and they'd buy the album <laughs> because somebody in the know who like, like magically messaged them over something called the World Wide yeah. Web, they must know if they're go, like, go, yeah, going. Yeah, they were so excited because yeah. oftentimes it was the first time they ever received an email. Yeah. An unsolicited email, but it was their first one. They were excited. Thank you. Blah, blah, blah. And, and because of this, Richard and I, this is a long way to get to a point. Richard and I had this idea, and it wasn't like a light bulb moment. It wasn't some great epiphany. It was over a couple of years of understanding what was happening in the web by leveraging that new technology to see, okay, this is gonna change the world. It's gonna transform things so people will not only be creating uh, 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 digitally and consuming digitally, this will be the primary way yeah. it's gonna happen. So in 1997, we transformed our office on the Lower East Side, which happened to be on 45 Orchard Street, mm -hmm. into a company called The Orchard, which was the first digital distribution company of music, mm -hmm. 1997. We envisioned a world where people would be going to virtual stores and buying music mm -hmm. and paying for music. Great idea. I was so proud of myself with this idea, except we were way too early. Yeah. It was 1997. Yeah. Th there was no stores. I mean, Napster, which was illegal, forget about Napster, but that was June of 1999. Yep. iTunes wasn't until April. 02, 03, 03 or something. 03, yeah, 03, 03. Yeah. Like, so it was challenging being so early, but ultimately the company became very big. Um, I stayed with them until 2019, we sold it to Sony in 2015, I stayed on. 
when I left in 2019, it was doing a billion dollars wow. a year in revenue. That's crazy. You know, it's interesting. You talked about the technology of the time, and you obviously um, had a bit of a, I don't know if you use the term, but epiphany about what this technology could do for, uh, a, you know, a business that was very analog right, for the most part, right? And, you know, it's funny. My senior year in college was also 1995, and I took a class on the World Wide Web in, in, in the spring. They right, had a right class as a, on the web. And, 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 and I had an assignment. And we had to do something using the web to catalog something. And you know what's really interesting? This is probably at the time where, you know, Jeff Bezos, um, you know, decided to leave a hedge fund and start a company um, doing e-commerce on the World Wide Web. And he went, and you've read all the stories, he, went, he figured out what's the most cataloged thing out there, okay, that he could put on there and he could list there and then people could come and transact and it was books, right? And then it went into CDs and it went into DVDs and the like. At the time, I actually had the same epiphany as Jeff Bezos, but I didn't do anything with it. So for my assignment, I was a huge Dead fan, Grateful Dead, okay? And the fans there are obviously, you know, they're always posting um, the, the concerts um, and the set lists, and they're talking about them, that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, they had this ability to do it on the World Wide Web. And so I cataloged all the shows that I had seen over the last few years. Now, that happened to be the final tour, the summer of 1995, and I saw them open in Highgate, Vermont in June of 1995, uh, and then Jerry died sad in early August um, but I had that epiphany I did this thing on the web um, I could have become you know a, an internet billionaire and web 1.0 I did not do that by any means but really interesting also in 2011 Bob Weir came on CNBC's Fast Money the show that I was on and a couple of us were big deadheads and we were talking about this new project that they were working on at the time Bob and, and he had a partner and it never really went anywhere but my comment to him on air was like you guys for all intents and purposes created one of the first social networks when you think about the network of the yeah, fans. Yeah, forget about the underlying right? technology. Yes. It was the network. Correct. And that's the thing it sounds like that you leveraged on back then or over the last couple of decades to kind of um, build this thing. So talk to me a little bit like where you came. 2019, you sell the company, you go to Warner. Any epiphanies there at Warner yeah, Music? Yeah, so, so, so actually sold the company earlier, yeah. left after a few years just because I was ready to retire. I, I put in my notice and told him I was leaving. Um, and, I, and I thought I was retiring, and uh, I didn't. Instead, um, Max Lusada, the CEO of Warner Music Group, um, convinced me to come on board, and I became the chief innovation officer for the Warner Music Group, mm -hmm. which was very interesting because if at the Orchard, it was taking nothing and building it into something huge, and at Warner, it's taking something already huge, mm -hmm. and how do you navigate it into the future? Mm -hmm. You know, you can see out onto the horizon, but what's over the horizon? Mm -hmm. um, I would, uh, so it, w it was an amazing experience, but if I'm being truly honest, I would say it's also my biggest career failure. Um, working inside a large organization, um, I don't know. I, I, maybe I, you know, it's me. You have to be the right. Type it sucked of all the energy, uh, entrepreneurial sort of like juices out of you a little bit. I think that's a good yeah. way to put it. I'm yeah. trying to say it in the nicest way. Yeah. But I prefer building things, and the other at a large organization is about you have an idea, you know what to do, you yeah. know how to do it, you know who's going to do it, you have a budget for it, and you think you can start work. Oh no, you can't. It's spend the next year lobbying yeah. internally and getting everybody aligned, and it's just not the way I operate. All right, so let's talk about Jukebox. That's, again, JKBX. Let's talk about Sam Hendel. Uh, how, how did you, get you and Sam meet? And then what was the pitch there? Because, again, it sounds like you went through this period where, you know, amazingly entrepreneurial for a couple decades um, and, and successful at it. And then have I'm sure you learned a, a, a ton uh, at Warner Music about maybe th even things not to do. It'd be like the, the whole idea is a CIO it, it, with the innovation is like, you know, what's next? But they weren't really probably ready to embrace, you know what I mean, how to break the mold a bit and so here you are you meet sam and and, and what's the pitch and, and and was it the jukebox that exists we're going to talk about that obviously well, in a second. well it, it, it's funny it that wasn't how, how it happened it happened that caa has an executive recruiting arm for mm -hmm. entertainment and sports and uh i got this call from from that team danny Berghoff runs the team and and they called me, not because they wanted me, mm -hmm. they called me like, you apparently know everyone, 
and we're looking for somebody that has entrepreneurial experience mm -hmm. in the in the music business has built something from the ground up i'm like okay yeah I, and that. and we're looking for somebody that also understands large organizations and in particular in the music industry and how that works um if they have uh, a tech background i'm thinking yeah and and blockchain i'm like yeah i'll talk about blockchain all day long and then i'm like what is this gig that you're looking for that a recommendation and they said well let me sign an signed an NDA, mm -hmm. signed an NDA. They told me a bit about the business and I'm like, you know what? I decided I'm not going to recommend anyone. I want this gig. Mm -hmm. And I had to then go back to my wife again and say, remember how I said I was retiring <laughs> from the orchard? And then I said, I'll just do this one gig at Warner and retire. Uh, I'm not ready to retire yet um, because what we're, what we're doing is transformation. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about it. I mean, so so was the plan that essentially when you met Sam and he laid out, is it the plan that you are implementing now as a CEO? And let's describe what that is. Um, it, on the highest level. Yeah. I mean, he had, so, so what Sam Handel had done was he and some other folks bought a large catalog of music. Mm -hmm. We're talking very large. I think they spent $1.1 billion mm -hmm. to acquire a catalog of rights and then added to it and got the till it was I think they ultimately um, had 1.7 billion dollars under management mm -hmm. and he was looking for new ways to exploit it and he thought how how do we involve the people and fans in in this because when you look around you know you see all these catalog acquisitions mm -hmm. Justin Bieber sold his catalog for 200 million yeah and the thing is I'm not a Justin Bieber fan but I'll tell you what if I had a chance to buy some of those rights, I would have. Yeah. But it was essentially one share, yeah. which equaled two hundred yep. million dollars. Um, so the the idea is, how do we let regular people invest in music alongside the big guys? So so Sam, you know, obviously did this deal. Um, they own these rights, and, and again, you, you use the term exploit, and, and, and you're really trying to broaden it out and, and, and basically say what are what are the different ways that we can basically monetize these rights to this you know to this catalog. Um, what was it about letting, and it's not just fans, it's people who want to be opportunistic. This is something that we learned a little bit about this kind of whole Web3 craze over the last few years that seemed to die out a little bit. I mean, when you financialize things that people have a connection to, right, sometimes you get animal spirits going and things start trading at levels that maybe aren't warranted by, you know, like, let's say, you know, the fundamentals of the underlying, if you will. Does that make sense a little bit? And so I'm just curious, like, what was it um, about, you know, Sam's vision for this that really attracted you to the idea of, let's say, whoever participating in these rights? And it was really, these are fractional, fractionalized ownership of music. Yeah, I mean, uh, his vision and my vision are aligned, but also different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, yeah. You know, we approach it differently. You know, for me, I saw this as adding a layer of revenue to the music industry. Mm -hmm meaning technology and business that have come before are typically disruptive mm -hmm. and 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 that you know uh cds disrupted the cassette and downloads disrupted the 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 cd so itunes took over from mm -hmm. cd stores and then spotify comes in and streaming disrupts the download market so i like what we're doing because it doesn't take away so for our business to work, we have to have major labels, mm -hmm. independent labels, DIY artists, Spotify, Apple Music, uh, Amazon. We have YouTube. So it's not TikTok. cannibalizing anything. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. We're creating a layer of value on top of the existing industry. Okay, so is the value, who is it being accrued to by the rights holders? Like, so for instance, if you think about, uh, you know, a lot of folks in the music industry went through a really difficult time, as you know, during the pandemic, right? When you think about I, how- I don't know if I agree with that statement. Well, I, and, and you and I, you know, can chat about that um, probably till we're blue in the face. No, but no, no, but, but factually, so publishers and record labels, their, their business went up there was more music consumption. Because there was more consumption, right. But if Touring you, went down. Touring went down, but if you talk to a lot of musicians, I mean, when they were earning the bulk of their income from touring, for the most part, right? right? And I don't mean like the, the A-listers that are s selling out Madison Square gonna Garden. We're going to have to do a second podcast on okay. just the music biz. Let, let, let's definitely do that. But I, I, you know, I, I know one in particular who's been on the podcast and was just saying is that, like, for instance, they don't make any money on their streaming, but they have a very, like, they, they have a, 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 a rabid fan base that where their tickets 
tickets will sell out to shows and they buy a lot of merch and all that sort of stuff. And so like to me, you know, that, that maybe that's purely um, anecdotal. But what I'm saying is, is like, you know, for you guys, you own this catalog. But maybe we should back up because yeah. I don't even think we explain what we do. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, so just very quickly. So there's, there's rights home owners so yes. they own copyrights yep. either publishing rights which means the compositions those people mm -hmm. that wrote the songs or sound recordings those people that recorded the songs they're often not the same people right um but most artists sell them pretty quickly that's part of their deals for the most part right um, they, they go away not necessarily it's that maybe they don't they never own them to get a record deal right then the the record label owns those Correct. master recordings yes. um and they'll do publishing deals around their their compositions uh, and there's reasons for it right. and it's all positive there's nothing wrong with it um it, it is how the music industry works um so we work with those large rights holders the ones that are buying these big catalogs that you hear about yep. and what we do is we take portions of the income from songs so they keep the copyrights mm -hmm. we just say let's say a song makes a million dollars a year we say all right give us 10 percent 10% of the song is 100 grand a year yep. and put some multiple on it, 20X multiple or something. And now it's a $2 million asset. Mm -hmm. We then get that qualified at the SEC mm -hmm. through an issuer. Mm -hmm. And one, what happens after that is we take those income streams and essentially convert them into regulated securities mm -hmm. that people can buy and sell. So. Who benefits from that? Well, first, the rice holders, because they've, they've, they've taken a piece of their catalog and brought, let's say, 20X or 20 years income forward, and mm -hmm. that's free cash mm -hmm. flow. That's, that's a really nice thing. Mm -hmm. Who else benefits? The, the fan and the retail investor, because now they can participate in that, because then they get a dividend-like yield from this, mm -hmm. and it's also tradable. Um, we added another participant who wasn't involved in the value chain, which is the songwriters and the recording artists, because they weren't part of this. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no royalty to be And paid. that's where I was kind of getting at, in, in a way, because, I, you, you know, like, once they've sold away, you know, those kind of initial rights, they were kind of, like, the, the record deals were kind of keeping them a away from any of those other than just the royalties that come from, from streams, correct? Right, right. Yeah. Which is, so, so, so we created this... Um, or we established this creator program yeah. where we have a pot of money and based on, you know, if people have music that's that's being sold on our platform that's listed, we will pay those creators, even though we have no contractual obligation mm -hmm. or no royalty obligation. It's the right thing to make sure songwriters and recording artists are rewarded. And that just comes out of our our side. We just created a large fund for that. Yeah, and so I, I, when you think about then, okay, so so as securities, um, and you've only been doing this for a short period of time, so that would assume that there's a secondary market for, for these rights too, right? And so I, I'm just curious, like, have you guys seen and have you been able to have enough um, time and data to see, like, you know, like... No, 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 yeah. no we, we have had no time to get enough data. Yeah. We, we, we launched on September 12th, yeah. and we're doing this in a way that'll feel much like uh, a traditional IPO, yeah. where every song is its own IPO. Yeah. And so that means in the phase one, it's, it's you know, testing the waters, yeah. you know? They're going around like, like a company would do their road show and build their book and yeah. say who's in. We do that initially, and that's the phase we're in now. The next phases are then the day of the, the primary, we go back, you said you wanted so many shares, yeah. you're still in, um, and then a secondary market after that. It's pretty fascinating. So look, when you think about this and, and um, you know, if, if you're a fan and there's limited ways that you can really engage with like, uh, you know, like some act, right? You can um, subscribe to a service and they're getting fractions of a penny per listen, right? You can buy the vinyl directly from them and merch and that sort of thing. You can obviously go to their shows and, and, and that sort of thing. There's, but, but most fans actually don't even get to do a lot of that stuff, right? So. This gives you the opportunity to think about it as like, if you love this band and you know that you and there's a community of others, right, are gonna continue to listen to this and they're gonna to continue to kind of accrue value, you can participate in that upside. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think there's two ways that I think about it. The first way is, I, I was here in the city in, in June. I, I don't live in New York anymore, I live in London. Yeah. So I was here in the city in June and, and I heard this guy speak and I wish I could give, 
give his name and credit him, yeah. but I don't remember. <laughs> I don't even remember his job, but he worked at the NFL. Yeah. And he was pretty senior at the NFL. And what he said was, fans of football. So not somebody that's not a fan, like, yay, I love the Jets. <laughs> you know, get your heart cut out every oh year. My goodness. But yay, I love the Jets or, or, or the Dolphins or the Patriots. It doesn't matter. You're a fan of football. When the fan of football starts playing fantasy football, their spend on football goes up three to four yeah. X every year. Yeah. We're thinking, this is in fantasy land, this is real. When people start investing in music, will their spend on music go up as well? Again, transformational. Uh, that's one. Two is, I think historically the music industry has not been great about monetization. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you sell the copyrights, you, there's some merch and some touring. And then after that, there are no more ideas. And if I look at other industries, like I have this friend Gino, <laughs> who lives in the north of Italy. Um, that's why his name is Gino. Yo, Gino. Um, and Gino was working in the cycling business. So, you know, bicycles. Yeah. Um, and he said the average cycling enthusiast spends three to 5,000 euros a year on cycling. You yeah. know, they get the gloves, the helmet, a new seat for their bicycle. They get the spandex pants, always a good look. Um, and they spend three to 5,000 a year. Then you, you look at other things, you know, yoga. Like how much did yeah. somebody that's passionate about yoga spend on yoga every year? Uh, they get the mat, they go to the yoga classes, a yoga retreat, yeah. again with the spandex pants. Or you like skiing. Yeah. You don't, I'm not saying you love skiing. You just like it and you go away skiing. How much do you spend? $3,000, $4,000 for a week of skiing? Yeah. Now, let's say you're a, a passionate music fan. Pay your Spotify subscription, yeah. 120 bucks a year. You go to a couple of gigs, you get some merch, a nice piece of vinyl. Uh, you might struggle to spend $500 a year. Yeah. To get somebody to spend 1,000 a year, pff, nearly impossible. Yet every other passion that people have, they'll spend thousands a year. And so what I'm hoping is we can tap into this to say, we just need to give people the opportunity yep. to tap into their passions that they love, and that happens to be music. Well, it's funny that you mentioned the fandom and that you use the NFL as an example, because this is something that I say all the time. I mean, I'm a huge sports fan, but I don't go to that many NFL games anymore because in New York, it's really disappointing, like, like you just mentioned. But here's the deal. You got a 50-50 chance, it's probably actually kind of skewed the opposite way when you go and pay $250 to go to MetLife Stadium and watch the Jets and then you spend you know a couple hundred dollars to get there and a couple hundred dollars on beer and food and this and that whatever there's a really good likelihood that you're going to leave there pissed off because they blew the game yes. okay <laughs> so think about that and I've been to hundreds of concerts in my life I just went to five in the last month and I spent thousands of dollars between tickets and travel and pregame and postgame and all that and I am grinning ear to ear so you walk with a band that you love or a festival that you love, you walk out 90% of the time a very happy person. And those to me are really different value propositions and it speaks to exactly what you're talking about. So if I say to myself, I have the ability to participate in the, um, you know, I, I guess in the success of this band, to be part of a community, to help them make a living on it, to actually cultivate uh, an ecosystem that makes it better for other up and coming bands that did not exist until very recently. So I think your point, what you were saying about the music business and we should do another podcast is that, yeah, there was a time that Napster and some of these streaming service appeared to have broken it but it, technology being harnessed the right way really offers a much better ability to monetize fandom if you are a band and and, and as a fan to actually participate a, a bit more in in what's being created as far as the art and the community a hundred percent yeah yes should i be a pitch guy for this thing yeah uh, I mean, that was <laughs> you're on board yeah, i yeah. got uh, you uh, no i am on <laughs> board in. but i'm also a markets guy scott so so what you're speaking to is something <laughs> that seems really sophisticated you know I, we've seen it in, in fractionalized art. We've seen it in some of the, and, and they're not exactly the same, you know. But we, similar, yeah, the, ex except yeah. this is an asset that's, that's way more liquid. Yeah. I mean, a piece of art is great, but y y you know, you're not selling it all day long. It's yeah. like every however many years. What, what I would say about music as an asset class, and this is, again, it's not about artists, but it's about the songs. Yeah. So you, you're not investing in an artist, you're investing in a song with a track record 
because we can see the earnings history of it. Right. But when you think of music as an asset class, for the retail investor, it might be the first time they actually understand what they're investing in. Yeah. Like they might buy a tech stock, they might buy something as big as Apple, yeah. but do they actually understand what's driving Apple's business? Yeah. Do, do they understand well, they what's happening? they listen to Chamoles like me rather than listening to your band. <laughs> on, you know what I mean? Or something like that. No, no I but, agree but, with that. But if I put a song in front of them, yeah. if I say, here's Halo, written by Ryan Tedder, but yeah. you know it because this was the song recorded by Beyonce, you go, oh, I know that song. And I, and I have an instinct that says, not only is this song big now, but I bet you people will be listening to it 10 and 20 years from now when their high school reunion, yeah. at their weddings, it'll be used in films in the future. I know that song. So how, how will fans who want to participate, you just said you just launched a couple weeks ago, how will they participate in, in, in buying these things? Where will they own these and, and ho house these rights? If we just think back to a couple years ago, this NFT craze, a lot of the things made sense about the community, about you know participating in the upside of these projects and stuff like that. I'm not saying they needed to be blockchain based or anything like that. And I had the view back then is like, it's one thing to love a piece of art and to love the community that you're a part of. But as soon as you financialize that, it becomes a different thing, right? And to me, I've started in the in the business of markets in the late 90s and we saw the internet bubble inflate and it kept on going much further than most people thought but when it popped it overshot to the downside and I was fairly certain that was going to happen with, with a lot of web3 projects and that sort of thing there wasn't too many ways to short that but the flip side of what you're doing right now these are financialized assets in in, in what they are because right yeah, I mean yeah like, but I, so so Two, two, two things here that come to mind. First is what we're doing will be fully regulated by the SEC yep. and FINRA. Like, yep. let's just leave it at that. Yep. These are securities, and the way you buy and sell securities is, uh, you know, is, 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 is uh, securities is secure. I mean, yeah. it's, it's trusted. So, yep. so that's very different than what came before. Second, I'm a huge believer in the blockchain. Yep. However, anytime the general public is throwing around the lingo of a technology like coins and tokens yeah. and crypto wallets and the blockchain and NFTs, you know it's immature. Yeah. I mean, you said Napster. When, back in the day of Napster in the early 2000s, we knew the technology. We talked about MP3s or Apple used the AAC format for iTunes yeah. or there was WMA, which was Microsoft format. We talked about codecs formats around music but today do you know what file format spotify uses nope. apple music youtube TikTok. you have no clue music just plays yeah i'm a huge believer in the blockchain and we may we may use it <laughs> as technology for our company that enables certain things to happen but i guarantee you you will never hear the words nft yeah blockchain tokens coins look the technology is there to serve a larger purpose when you lead with it you know it's immature all right so where if i want to i want to go look at your catalog i want to look at the offerings that you're because obviously you're going to have a very limited amount of offerings i'm assuming uh, you know out of the gate um and i want to buy you know like rights to these things where do I do it and where do I know that I hold it? Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like, you know, I have a Fidelity account. I can see what stocks or funds and, and that I, I hold. And I, and I also have a mark to market. You know what I mean? So I'm just, how are you guys thinking about all that? I know that you have some pretty good models to follow here because, again, you just use the example of this being SEC and FINRA registered. And we all know what to expect when we're yeah. buying security under those. More than that, I should have said this at the beginning, but I'm going to say it now. Yeah. Please don't edit this out. But I got this this kind of panic message from no from um, our, our our chief legal officer um, a couple of days ago, and he's because he, he knew I was going to be yeah. on here, and he he, he asked me read, if I read would the disclaimer. Read a Go disclaimer. Ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, and so nothing I'm about to say <laughs> should be viewed as investment advice or an offer for solicitation of interest in any securities offering. And number two, neither I nor Jukebox, that is the parent company 
the parent entity in our family of entities, nor the jukebox platform is offering or soliciting interest in any securities offering. Just so you know, as, as a podcaster <laughs> who talks markets, we have a blanket um, disclaimer like oh. that about all guests and this and that. Because he's freaking me out. Like No, he, but, he, but listen, it's it, it's fine. We, we have the disclaimer. We're not going to edit it out. It, good, it's fine. good stuff. So let's talk about like, like how somebody would access your platform. So, how so, do they see what's available? How do they purchase so it? So right now it's in the testing of the waters yeah, phase. Yeah. So they go in and they, they can express their interest like they see us a, 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 a share price mm -hmm. they see previous years earnings so mm -hmm. they can understand it they can we've calculated a, a, a trailing yield so mm -hmm. they could understand if it was based on last year what would the yield be um, and then they can express their interest like, oh, 1750 a share, I'll yep. take 10 shares and you create a book like you would like you said Correct. for an IPO and That's that is the phase we're in now um, you can go there. It's it. We're called Jukebox, but spelled like a ticker symbol, yep. JKBX. So it's JKBX.com. Mm -hmm. Go there, set up an account, and reserve some shares if you so like. But I would not advise you of which ones to reserve. Yeah, one way um, or it's, another. It's all non-binding in this stage, and then you know, soon. I can't, you know, I have to be so careful with my language about yeah. getting qualified by the SEC and when and all of that. But when all this happens, then you'll be able to, to trade. And, and you suspect early on there'll be a combination of just kind of early tech adopters, music fans, uh, folks looking to be, well, you I know, think speculate on, on, on stuff. And you, well, yes and no. I actually think music is a fairly stable asset class yeah. and, and uncorrelated um, to, the, to, the, to the markets because, um, you know, you get paid from music regardless. Yep. So it doesn't matter if it's a recession. It's kind of recession proof a little bit. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and the notion is if, 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 if you know somebody's getting paid when a song's getting played, it might as well be you. Yeah. So we're looking at the full spectrum. So there's definitely music fans that are crazy about artists and songs. But on the other end, there's retail investors. You know, there's 63 million. Uh, individual investment accounts in this country and and it would be great if you know fidelity customers and yeah. Webull customers yeah. like from another end of the spectrum yeah. of investing have an opportunity to, to buy in on this I suspect that happens when you think about how um, aggressive fidelity has been integrating you know like blockchain based assets you know like crypto assets in general um, again this is something where we, the, there's data behind you know all this like it, it, and if they're SEC registered um, it makes perfect sense to me I mean listen this, this is pretty fascinating stuff because again um, like it's technology that's actually the unlock here for some degree and then it also has to be folks that are willing uh, you know on, on a certain level like you know Sam and his partners they bought this catalog you know what I mean they could have just sat on it and earned the, the, the you passively know what I mean earn the pa money. passively earn the money but this really does create um, a new stream and it creates this kind of connection where fans have the ability to participate in for, uh, further upside but also get in early on some new artists I suspect it's not just about the legacy well, catalog it, it, I, I will say, in phase one, we're, we're yes. focusing on songs with an earnings history, Correct. hit songs that you'd know. I can see later on next year us experimenting and, you know, these they would then have a much higher risk profile. Yeah. You know, what we're saying is, look, this song, you know, was a number one song and this is how much it earns every year. It's very clear. Yeah. And if someone does participate, let's say, say this first, if you want to call it the version of an initial sort of offering um, and the thing trades at a price and you own a, a, a piece of this, where do you own it? How do you know that you own it? Where does it exist? Well, so so it's either directly with us and, yes. you know, you have a Q-SIP or something like that, exactly. as you would with a stock. Yeah. Or if you're coming through y your own uh, uh, brokerage, yeah. let's say a Fidelity or yeah. Webull, then you keep it in that account. Yeah. Uh, fascinating stuff, Scott. Um, this is uh, amazing. I hope you do come back. I think that you and I would love to talk more about other aspects of the market. Again, you've had this story career um, in the music business. Not a musician, thanks to your sister, um, yeah. who, who, who stunted that yes. uh, very early on. But And also thanks to Sam Hendel for um, making this introduction. Because this is fascinating to me from both a markets person and also somebody who's interested in music. And we're going to track this. And it's going to be fascinating to watch how this goes. Well, it, to me, it's, it's, it's really interesting interesting because there was music and, and, and the intersection of technology, yeah. which has always driven music. And then there was fintech. Yep. And then the intersection of music and and fintech, I think, is super interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, I hope you'll come back. This fascinating conversation. Thanks, Scott Cohen, the CEO of Jukebox. Thank you very much.